Good morning. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm uh, Mike Brumell. I'm one of the elders at uh, JICF. I think I know most of you, but uh, anyway. Um, today we're going to kick off uh, a series on the uh, book of Ephesians. Um, we say book, it's uh, more like a, a letter, of course. Um, it's uh, written to the church, the believers in Ephesus. And it's written by the Apostle Paul. Um, I was uh, reminded um, a couple days ago, I was taking a shower, and I thought, you know, I'm preaching through Ephesians, and actually 50 years ago, uh, in 1973, I was uh, attending church for the first time in many time, many years. I had just become a believer and was attending the church, and they were starting to teach through the book of Ephesians. So 50 years later, I'm... Not there, but I'm here, <laughs> uh, preaching through the, through the book. And uh, it was uh, the first time I'd ever heard somebody teach through a book in the Bible. And it was, uh, became very clear as we went through what the meaning was. And um, it was the first time I think I'd, I'd been on the edge of my seat listening to what the, the book uh, said. Um, the purpose of today, we're, we're only going to be covering two verses, but uh, we're going to uh, dig a little bit deeper because there's some uh, context for the book, and it's important before we start going through the book, we understand the background to the, the people involved, uh, both the Apostle Paul himself and the, the church in Ephesus to whom uh, he was writing. Um, the verses that we are looking at, are here in Ephesians 1 and 2. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So kind of the outline for the sermon is kind of this. We're going to be looking at the apostle Paul, his background. Um, When it says he was an apostle by the will of God, what that meant, how that came about, how he became an apostle, um, how it was by the will of God. And we'll look at the holy people in Ephesus, those that were believers, that were followers in the Lord Jesus Christ, how the church began. And uh, then we'll be looking at um, some of the the general topics of the book um, that are addressed when he's talking about using the words grace and peace. Um, I've discovered those aren't just throwaway words. There, there's a meaning for those, particularly in the book of, of Ephesians. So, uh, let's talk about the Apostle Paul, a uh, little bit of, of his background. I know some of you probably know this very well. Some of you probably don't. So, uh, bear with me as we, we talk about who the Apostle was. Um, the Apostle Paul um, started off his life He was a very religious Jew, and when people became Christians, and most of the early Christians were Jewish by background, when they started believing that Jesus indeed was the long-awaited Messiah, when that happened, uh, Paul did everything he could to stop it. He did everything he could to destroy the church. Then... He, he uh, uh, had a, um, there was an intervention when the Lord Jesus appeared to him. And from that time on, he did everything he could to build up the church. So talk about somebody doing a 180 degree. He did it. Totally changed. Paul, if you are not aware of it, wrote about half of the books in the New Testament. We have 27 books in our New Testament. He wrote 13 of those. Um, There are some people that think that he may have written um, the book of Hebrews uh, because it addresses, uh, refers to Timothy, uh, say hello to Timothy, and of course Paul was very close to Timothy. Um, But but anyway, at least 13 books I think are attributed to the Apostle Paul. So that's quite a a few. Um, Just so you're also aware, um, and we'll look at this a little bit later, um, Paul was... Uh, a, a business person. We tend to think that he was uh, just a full-time missionary, a full-time evangelist. He was actually in business. 
And we'll see he was going around working, making tents in the various places he was visiting, um, supporting himself, not all the time, but um, we have examples of this throughout the book. So I say that because don't think that if you're a business person or a professional, uh, don't think that God can't use you because you haven't been to seminary and you're not full-time uh, as a pastor or a teacher or whatever. Um, Paul, it says, was an apostle. Um, the word apostle in Greek refers to one that is sent out. And Paul, the apostle Paul, he was uh, sent out by the Lord Jesus himself. Um, in 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, it says there are certain things that prove that somebody is, a, uh, is an apostle. And one of those things it says is that they can do signs, wonders, and miracles. And if you look at the book of Acts, you will see that Paul did various signs, wonders, and miracles. And it says that those signs, wonders, and miracles that Paul did confirmed that God indeed was speaking through uh, the Apostle Paul. Um, it says, I per persevered in demonstrating among you the marks of a true apostle, including signs, wonders, and miracles. And he, he wrote this because some people were questioning whether he indeed was an apostle. Um, and he was. And I, I know that today it kind of bothers me. A lot of people claim to be an apostle, um, but uh, I don't think they have the, necessarily the credentials um, to be. Now, this is the story of Paul. Um, this is the first time we read about him in the book of uh, Acts, in Acts uh, chapter 6 uh, and 7. It talks about this guy named Saul, and that was the um, name that often he was referred to early on. Saul apparently was the Jewish name that he had. Paul was probably the Roman name that he had. I know from um, past experience working with, with refugees, sometimes they have a name in Afghanistan, and then they have a Western name as well because people have trouble with the, with the uh, name from the country they, they came from. So that's not unusual that he had, he had two names, Saul and Paul. But anyway, it talks about um, Stephen, and this is the first martyr uh, we read about in the New Testament, where he had become a, a believer. He was speaking boldly. He was speaking before the, the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish ru ruling council. And uh, Stephen um, gave a speech, and included in that speech, he basically accuses the Jewish leaders, um, rightly, of plotting to kill uh, the Messiah. And they didn't like it. Um, they, they rushed out, um, and they, they drug uh, Stephen out of the city and stoned him to death. And you can read here, it says, The witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul approved of their killing him. So Saul was there. He was a witness to the first uh, Christian that was killed. And he was happy that the Christian was killed because he wasn't happy that some of the Jews were um, following um, and believed the fact that Jesus was a Messiah. Um, Paul uh, later on uh, talks about himself, but uh, um, just to see what Paul says about himself, he, he was a Jew. He was uh, um, a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, um, he was, which he was very proud of. Uh, he was also a Pharisee. Um, he was very um, fervent about his faith. It says he was born in uh, Tarsus. I don't know if you can see. This is uh, Tarsus right here. This is in southern uh, Turkey. And it says he was born there. And it says he studied under Gamaliel. Gamaliel, uh, Gamaliel was part of the Jewish ru ruling council. And he also was a, a prominent Pharisee, uh, just like Paul was. You may remember he, in the, in the book of Acts, there was a situation where after the resurrection, the apostles were going into the temple, and it says they were doing many signs, wonders, and miracles, which is what you would expect the apostles to be doing. They were doing many miraculous things. They were, they were spreading the good news, and the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, got very worried about this, you know. Um, so we got we to gotta stop this. Um, they arrested the apostles. They put them in prison, and... Um, then the next morning, they went to the prison to have them uh, taken out. The, the guards went to the prison to have them taken out, and they were gone. 
And actually, during the night, they had been miraculously released. They were back that morning in the temple, and they were doing, again, continuing on, preaching the, the good news. And what happened was they were, these, these apostles were brought before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was debating whether they should kill the apostles. And Gamaliel, Gamaliel stood up in that meeting and said, I think that's not a good idea. Because if, it's, if this movement of these people that are following Jesus as the Messiah is not of God, it will just die a natural death. <laughs> but if it is something from God, you're going to find yourself fighting against God, and I don't think you want to do that. <laughs> so um, he was a voice of reason within the Sanhedrin, and this was the one that was the mentor for the Apostle Paul. Nonetheless, we see that the Apostle Paul himself was quite, um, quite zealous for God. He says, I was just as zealous as God as any of you today. That's when he's speaking to the Jews that were rioting in uh, Jerusalem. Now, <clears throat> what happened is trying to go after the Christians in Jerusalem wasn't enough. Paul said, I've got to, I need to go and, and go after these people that are Christians in uh, other places. And he decided to go to Damascus in Syria. It says, meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So he had witnessed a, a, a martyrdom, a murder of Stephen, and he, he wanted to do the same. He, he was out to, to, to get these uh, Christians. And so what he did is he went to the high priest. He says he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So if he found any there who belonged to the way, that way is the Christian faith, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So you can see he was, he was very zealous, very much against Christians. And what happened is, Jesus appears to him. He's approaching Damascus. He says, as he neared Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then Saul answered, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Saul was blinded, um, and he was, uh, so he was taken into the city. At the same time, God appeared uh, to Ananias. And it says that, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. And what happened is God was telling Ananias, there's this guy named Saul. I want you to go to him and share the good news with him. And if you continue reading the story, what happened is, is Ananias said, no way. <laughs> I heard about this guy. He's coming to Damascus to arrest people, to take them to Jerusalem. He wants these people, he wants us dead. And then the Lord said, go. I, I've chosen this man. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. You know, I know some people have uh, personal mission statements. This is, I think, the mission statement that God had given to Paul, that he was to go and proclaim the name of Christ to the Gentiles and the kings and the people of Israel. And that's, again, what Paul understood his mission to be, especially to go to the, the Gentiles. Now, immediately after he came to faith, he was baptized. And then it says that he spent several days with the disciples. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. This is in Damascus. Right, um, And all of those that heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take us prisoners to the chief priests? Hasn't he come to take us to Jerusalem and arrest us? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is a Messiah. Very, very quickly, he had done a 180. He started proclaiming that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. 
He was killing people before that said that Jesus is Messiah. Now he's, he's the one that's proclaiming that Jesus is a Messiah. And it says, after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. So he's trying to initially kill the Jews that believed that Jesus was a Messiah. Now he's one of them, and they're trying to kill him. So what happened is when he learned of the plan, he went down to Jerusalem after he spent some time in um, Arabia and, and some other places. And then it says in Jerusalem, the same thing happened. He, he was speaking very boldly. It says Saul, Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews. Those were the Greek Jews. But again, they tried to kill him. So when the believers learned of this, they sent him to, down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus, the town from which he came, the town in which he was born. Now, that's the Apostle Paul. That's the background to the Apostle Paul. Um, church in Ephesus, you, you may not know where Ephesus is, but this is uh, in uh, modern-day Turkey. Uh, the town today is still there. I mean, it's the ruins of the town are there. There's no operating town there, but it's, it's called Ephesus. Um, and I think some of us had gone on a, not a mission trip, but had gone on a, a tour of the Holy Land and the, and the seven churches in, in Turkey. And this is one of the seven churches in Turkey. Um, and the ruins there are quite uh, stupendous. You know? So anyway, uh, that, this place still exists. And um, this is, uh, Paul went there for the first time um, on his second uh, missionary journey. Um, he went up through central Turkey, that was where he had been on his first mission trip. He went over to uh, Macedonia and then down to Corinth. Eventually, he went over to Ephesus and then back to uh, Jerusalem. Okay? Now, um, we're going to take a look at the time that he spent in uh, Corinth because that is where he met this couple named Aquila and Priscilla. And he took that couple, and they were the start of the church in Ephesus. He met them here, and he met them because of, of uh, they were doing business together. They were partners in tent making. They formed a partnership, business partnership. It says, after this, Paul left Athens, went to Corinth. There he met Jew, a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, uh, which is in northern Turkey, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. So he had, uh, Aquila and Priscilla had left Rome. They'd come to Corinth. Um, they were making tents, and Paul was a tent maker. It says, Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. So when it says he, he went to the synagogue every Sabbath, that would have been on a Friday night. He would have gone and used that as an opportunity to talk about Jesus being the Messiah that the Jewish people had been waiting for. And it says, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So apparently what happened is maybe uh, Silas and Timothy had been up in northern Greece. Um, they had checked out and see how, checked to see how the churches were doing in northern Greece. And they came back to Corinth and were surmising that they probably brought a gift back from the church up north. And then because of that, Paul didn't need to work and make tents anymore. So he was able to um, devote himself exclusively, full-time, um, to preaching and teaching about um, Jesus. And what happened is, um, in the uh, synagogue, um, he was getting pushback. It says, when they opposed Paul uh, and they became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own head, I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Again, this is what God wanted him to do, right? I mean, this is what the Lord Jesus said you're to do, is to go to the Gentiles. Typically, when he went to a town, 
the first place he would go to would be at a synagogue because he was Jewish, but he would share the good news with them. But then he recognized that his main ministry was to be to the, to the Gentiles. And as we go through the book of Ephesians, you'll see that apparently most of the people in the church were Gentiles. And I believe probably almost everybody here is a Gentile, by the way, non-Jew. There have been some people that I know that have come to JICF in the past, one or two that have come from Jewish backgrounds, but it's, it's pretty rare. Um, and it says that Paul and, um, stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, he, teaching them the word of God, and then he left um, the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, um, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. And then they arrived at Ephesus, this is the first time we, we have a record of him, of Paul having gone to Ephesus. He brought Priscilla and Aquila with him. He went into the synagogue, reasoned with the Jews, and when they declined to spend uh, more time with him, he declined. And he says, I will come back if it is God's will. But it says he left Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. So he had mentored or whatever, worked together with, Priscilla and Aquila for a year and a half, making tents, doing ministry together, and then he brought them with him on the way back to Jerusalem, dropped them off in Ephesus. And he didn't spend a lot of time in Ephesus. They said, please stay, Paul. And he said, sorry, I've got to get back. But at least he left Priscilla and Aquila behind to help get the church started in uh, Ephesus, the church that we read about in the letter to the Ephesians. Then what happens is it is apparently the will of God that um, Paul spent time in Ephesus because he takes a third missionary uh, journey. He leaves again um, from uh, Jerusalem and, and uh, um, Antioch, Tyre. He goes um, to Ephesus through um, the uh, uh, Turkey. You can see that the solid line there. And at the, he's going through Turkey, visiting a lot of the churches that he had first shared the good news with to see how they were doing. And then he went to Ephesus, and he stayed in Ephesus almost three years. He spent more time in this city, Ephesus, than any other city he spent time in, as far as we know. And he went, um, and we'll read a little bit about uh, what he did in Ephesus. Um, when he uh, first got to Ephesus, it says he entered the synagogue, as it was his uh, practice. He spoke boldly for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Some of them became obstinate. They became stubborn. They refused to believe, and they were publicly saying bad things about the Christian faith. So Paul left them, and it says he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Okay, there was apparently a lecture hall. Um, there are some footnotes in some early, uh, some manuscripts of the New Testament that said that Paul did this between 11 o'clock in the morning and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And apparently in the Mediterranean environment, this is before air conditioning, um, that's the way people worked. They, they worked, they got up in the morning, when the sun rose, they worked until about 11 o'clock. When the sun came out, it was very hot. And so they would go home, they would eat, they would take a nap or whatever, and then they'd come back to work after the, uh, around 4 o'clock, and they work until the evening. So during that window, apparently maybe 11 to 4, what happened um, is Paul would go into the lecture hall, and he was making available uh, information about the Word of God. He was teaching people, training people. And it says that he did that for two years so that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So from Ephesus, it just spread out over a lot of what is now modern-day Turkey uh, because of the things that Paul was teaching. And it says that he was speaking very boldly. This is... Um, after he's left Ephesus and he's gone back, um, he, he stops briefly in Miletus on the way back to Jerusalem. He, he calls for the elders of the church in Ephesus, and he reminds them, he says, 
Um, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you. When I was with you, I, but ha I have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared both to Jews and the Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he was trying to communicate, that people should turn away from their sin, they should repent, and they should follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He did it for two years. But, interestingly, when he was doing that, he was also a businessman. <laughs> he was supporting himself during that time in Ephesus. We know that because as he's talking to the elders that have come down from Ephesus on his way back to Jerusalem at the end of the third missionary journey, he says, um, I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. He was supporting himself making tents, and he was earning enough that he was able to give money to others that were doing ministry with him. He says, And everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. You see, by supporting himself, nobody could question Paul's motives. They didn't wonder why he was giving this message. He wasn't making a living. He wasn't making money. Um, you know, we, we see today on television some people, you know, preach the good news, and they have, live in very nice houses and very nice cars, and you really do have to kind of question people's motives. But nobody could question Paul's motives. He was supporting himself, and he wasn't making any money on it. He was a very credible person. Um, Ephesus, um, you, on the left-hand side, you see uh, the Temple of Artemis. Um, it is one of the seven wonders of the world. You've probably heard of this, the wonders of the world. There were seven of them. This is one of them. And inside the temple was Artemis, who was a female goddess. And on the right, you can see what she might have looked like. And there was a statue inside that temple. People would come to worship this goddess. Um, below, you see a, a picture of the theater. In, uh, we read about this in the book of Acts, where there was a riot in Ephesus. Uh, people were very upset that Paul was preaching that they shouldn't follow idols like Artemis. And as a result, what happened is the people that were making these uh, idols um, were concerned about losing business. So what happened? They, they rushed into the theater, they brought Paul into the theater, and we read about that, and the theater is still there until today. So if you go to Ephesus or Ephesus, you can see it. And this, this is a story um, here where there's a disturbance in Ephesus because of this guy named Demetrius, and he got all the people that were making these idols together, and they all rushed um, and, and tried to um, attack Paul and the people that were with him because they thought they were going to lose business. And this is in the theater, um, which is there today, where um, it looks like uh, this uh, account occurred. It says, when they heard this, they were furious. They began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and uh, Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. When the uproar ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and they encouraged him. After encouraging him, they sent him to Macedonia. So, again, you can see Paul getting uh, attacked. And then we read about Paul going back to Jerusalem. Okay. Now, what happened was, when Paul went back to Jerusalem, he brought a guy with him named Tychicus. Okay. Tychicus was from Ephesus. He was a Gentile from Ephesus. He brought him back to Jerusalem. And then the Jewish people made up a, a false report. And they said that Paul had brought Tychicus into Jerusalem 
the part of the temple in Jerusalem that was only the Jews could go into. There was a court of the Gentiles that the Gentiles could come into, but there was a place that was reserved only for the Jews. And there was a false rumor saying that Paul had brought Tychicus into that place. So there was a riot in Jerusalem. And what happened was um, Paul appealed. I mean, Paul was arrested. He appealed to Caesar because he didn't feel like he was going to get a fair trial in Jerusalem. And what happened is he was taken all the way to Rome, and he was put under house arrest there. And while he was there, he was writing this letter, the letter to the Ephesians, when he was in Rome. And he was there because of an Ephesian <laughs> that he brought with him um, to Jerusalem. And you can see this in the book of Ephesians. You can see, he says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. It was actually because of a Gentile that he was in prison, Tychicus. He talks about the mystery of the gospel, which is the fact that the Gentiles now are part of the church. Not just, it's not just the Jews only. And he says, for this mystery, he's an ambassador in chains. And they... The reason for this was uh, Trophimus, as I said. Actually, not Tychicus, it was Trophimus, my apologies. Tro Trophimus was the Ephesian that he brought into Jerusalem. Sorry. They both start with T. And uh, he's the one that uh, uh, Paul was in, uh, ended up in prison for, or in, under house arrest for. And while Paul was in Rome, while he's, um, he wrote several letters from Rome, including this particular letter, but he was there for two years. He was in his own rented house, um, and he was able to see visitors and, and proclaim the name of Christ while he was there. And then Tychicus is actually the guy that delivered the letter. <laughs> um, Tychicus is the guy that had been, I guess, in Rome with Paul. Paul wrote the letter, and Tychicus was the delivery service to uh, the church in, um, in Ephesus. And he delivered the letter, and he says, Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything, so that you may also know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage you. It's amazing. You know, Paul's in prison, and he's concerned about the church in Ephesus being encouraged. Why did Paul write the letter to the Ephesians? What, was, what instigated that, that letter? Well, um, it looked like there were some issues between the Jews and the Gentiles, the Jews and the non-Jews. Um, we know that there's a history of this in the Jewish religion. You may remember a few weeks ago we heard about Jonah, and Jonah was asked to go to Nineveh, and he went in the opposite direction because he hated the, the people in Nineveh so much because they weren't Jewish. And you see this in the book of Ephesians. It, it talks about us, Jews, Paul's talking when he says us. God chose us. God predestined us. I believe he's referring to us, the Jews. And he's saying, now you Gentiles are also entitled to participate with us. He says, uh, whereas the, 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 the Jews, he said, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has given us in the one he loves. And then he says, Therefore remember that formerly you, who are Gentiles, by birth and call the uncircumcised, remember that at that time you were without hope and without God in the world. You know, we know that the Jews were God's chosen people. The Gentiles were not, right? And he's addressing the Gentiles. And he's saying, you guys didn't have any hope in the world. But now uh, you do because you're part of the same body as us. Um, this is to give you an example of, of how this was a problem in the early church and perhaps was a problem in um, Ephesus. Um, you may remember the story where uh, Peter had a vision and he was asked by God to go into the home of Cornelius, who was a Gentile. And um, he did so uh, reluctantly. He shared the good news and the Gentiles, the Cornelius' family, became believers. They received the Holy Spirit and after that happened, Peter finally realized, hey, God's concerned about the Gentiles, not just us Jews. 
And it says, Peter says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. He's not only concerned about Jews, he's concerned about us Gentiles. But what happened is the word got back to Jerusalem about what happened, and people were very critical of Peter because Peter went into the home of a Gentile, and you're not supposed to do that if you're a Jew. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers, those are the Jews, criticized him and said, you went into the house of, an uns- of uncircumcised men and ate with them. You're not supposed to do that. The early church, who were Jews, didn't quite get it. They didn't quite get that God was concerned about the Gentiles too. And that was part of Paul's uh, mission as a, as a person, as an apostle, was to be the Gentile uh, an apostle to the Gentiles. Um, another theme you'll see through the book of Ephesians is it talks about a mystery, a mystery which is finally revealed. And the Apostle Paul defines what that mystery is in Ephesians 3. He says, This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and shares together in the promise of Christ. We are heirs together. Heir means that you're entitled to an inheritance, right? And what's happening now is it used to be that only the Jews were entitled as the chosen people to receive the inheritance from God. They had an inheritance. But now the Gentiles, the mystery is now, that's being, been revealed is that the Gentiles are also entitled to participate with the Jews in the, the blessings of God. This is a, another verse you'll see. It says, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but now you're fellow citizens with God's people and also a member of his household. So the Jews and the Gentiles have been brought together. Um, it wasn't as clear previously, but it has, that mystery has now been revealed. And we'll see that um, attempt by the Apostle Paul to make sure that the Gentiles and the Jews both realize that they're part of one body together, even though they come from different religious backgrounds, even though they come from different um, the nationalities, ethnicities. And Paul's greeting to the church is he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, again, I, I think I mentioned that sometimes when people say these things, kind of thing is it's just like a throwaway word it's like salam or something when you just greet people in the street but I think there's in in this book there's some uh, particular uh, emphasis on those words on grace and peace throughout the book Um, you can see here how many times the word grace is used Um, if you were to ask me how to define grace because it's one of these religious words that we tend to use a lot I, I like the distinction between grace and mercy. Um, mercy is not getting what we deserve, and grace is getting what we don't deserve. Okay? Mercy, we don't get what we deserve because we deserve to go to hell for our sins, right? And we don't get that if we're God's showing mercy to us. Grace, we're getting something we didn't deserve, which is a gift. And God has given us the gift. And in particular, I think in the book of Ephesians, that gift is we're being adopted into God's family. It says, in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship. We've been invited into God's family together. It's what we call like a blended family (laughs) where you have children of different races. In this case, you have the Jews and the Gentiles being brought together in one family. We've been adopted into that family with God as our Father. And there's privileges that come with adoption. One of the privileges of being adopted is you are entitled to an inheritance, right? When your parents die, if you've been adopted, you will inherit something. 
And it talks a lot in the book of Ephesians about the inheritance that we are entitled to. And in particular, in Matthew 25, it talks about the day of judgment when uh, Jesus separates the sheep and the goats. And he says, he turns to the ones on the right and says um, that they're entitled to receive the inheritance prepared for them. And we have this riches that talks about as well. We're entitled because we're members of that family. We're not talking about earthly riches. We're talking about heavenly riches. I, I mentioned this verse 5 from chapter 5 because it does talk about the inheritance. But it talks about it in the, in the sense that some people within the church apparently felt that they uh, were entitled, they were believers, but they were living very immoral lives. And Paul, and Paul basically warns them. He says, don't be deceived. You're not inheriting anything. <laughs> because you may think that you're a son, but you're not. <laughs> it says, for of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person. Such a person is an idolater. And there were a lot of idolaters in Ephesus. Such a person is an idolater. Any person like that, they don't have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. If you were a true son, and you've been adopted as a son into the family of God, you are entitled to an inheritance. But there are going to be people that think they are entitled that aren't. And the way we can see that, if they're really, they've been adopted into the family of God, is by the lifestyle they lead. Peace. That's another theme you see through the book of Ephesians. And it's talking about two kinds of peace. One is peace with God and also peace with each other. You can imagine you have, such a, you have the Jews and the Gentiles where the Jews wouldn't even step foot into the home of a Gentile, right? And the relationship probably wasn't very good. So in Ephesians 2, Paul says his purpose, this is God's purpose, was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace between the Jews and the Gentiles, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God. So we have peace with each other, peace with God through the cross, by which he put to death hostility. He came and preached peace to those who were near, Jews, peace to those who were uh, or, or far away, which were the Gentiles, and then peace to those who were near, who were the Jews. We don't have a church where you have Jews and Gentiles, right? <laughs> like I said, I don't think anybody, nobody I know here is a Jew, a Jewish background. But we do have other kinds of differences, uh, as I've, I've, I've mentioned and I think we talked about as elders. We probably have one of the most diverse churches I've, I've ever been in. I'm, I'm not probably, we do, at least that I've ever been in. You know, we have different nationalities. I don't know, maybe, I would guess maybe 30 different nationalities. We have different ethnic groups. We have people from different religious backgrounds. We have people, different educational backgrounds, different socioeconomic uh, status. It's a very, very diverse church. And I think as we learn how Paul talks about how, how they need to get along as one body, I think we can apply it in the sense that we have a lot of diversity within the church, which is good, by the way. I think it's, it's not healthy when everybody's alike. <laughs> I think sometimes some churches are like that because they feel like they can get along with each other. But I think we really grow when there's the diversity in the church. We learn from each other. We can learn things that we wouldn't otherwise learn if we're just hanging around people that are just like ourselves. But it's, a, it's an effort we need to make to be at peace with each other. And I think as, as I close, I'd like to just um, mention a couple things I'd like us to reflect on. As I look at the book, I think one thing that um, God wants us to do is to appreciate his grace, the gift that he's given to us, not only to be saved, but also to be adopted into him, his family, so that we can call him our father. And we can call each other brothers and sisters because we've been adopted into the same family. I think also, as we go through the book, 
because we're adopted into one family, we each have a job to do. You know, Hendra mentions uh, before, we're on, he distinguishes between a battleship and a cruise ship. <laughs> you know, we, we're not on a cruise ship. The church is not a cruise ship. The cruise is a battleship. Everybody has a role to play. And I think in a family, the same way. Everybody has a role to play. I, I would assume that most of you had um, work that your parents had given you to do when you were a child. I mean, I, I, I can't remember everything. I, I know I had to make my bed, brush my teeth. I had to, to, to dry dishes, things like that in the house. But everybody in our family had something, some role to play. And I think in, the, in our family, we also all need to pitch in, and we all have things that we need to be doing. And it's, don't think it's just for people that are full-time, because even Paul was not full-time missionary. Even Paul was a business person. A lot of people don't realize that. You know? and, and not only that, but he was in, listen, when he wrote this letter, he was under house arrest. And yet he's still doing ministry, even you know, in, in spite of his difficult situation. And we also have a responsibility to encourage others. Um, I didn't mention it because um, I didn't have time, but there's a guy named Barnabas that uh, took Paul under his wings after Paul became a believer, after Jesus appeared to him, because nobody trusted Paul. They figured it was, a, he said he's a Christian, they figured he's just, it's a, it's a trick <laughs> to find out who the Christians are, and then he's going to arrest us. But Barnabas, whose name is Son of Encouragement, he took Paul under his wings, he mentored him, he helped him and encouraged him. And if it wasn't for Barnabas, perhaps, <laughs> we wouldn't have all the, the letters that we have, that we read. But I think we also need to recognize that sometimes one of the best things we can do is encourage other people. We can be serving, but we need to encourage other people to, to be serving and, and, and following the Lord as well. And then finally, God wants us to be at peace with each other and with him. You know, we... we need to make every effort. And I think in the church in Ephesus, he, he mentions you need to make every effort to be at peace with each other. Sometimes it's, effort, it's, it's an effort when we're coming from different backgrounds um, and, and we're different in many, many ways. The tendency is to want to hang around people that are like ourselves. But that's not a family. I don't know about you. I've got four brothers and sisters some I'm closer to than others because I, you know, that's just the way it is. But I need to love them all. Probably me as a parent, maybe you have some children <laughs> that are a little more, you know, a little easier to, to, to have affection for than others. But you love them all. And that's, that's the kind of family that we're, we're part of. We need to love each other. And, you know, even though we're different. Let's pray. Father, we... Uh, we thank you for moving in the heart of uh, the Apostle Paul to write this letter to the Ephesians. We thank you that we have copies that were handed down through many generations so that we can read it and that we can learn from it. And I pray as we uh, begin this study through the book of Ephesians that you would open our hearts and our minds and help us to be even more united than we already are um, notwithstanding the, the differences that we have uh, between ourselves. We thank that you've put us into one body, and uh, we thank you that we have one hope, and we're citizens of, we're all citizens of the kingdom. We thank you for this in the name of your son, and we thank you for his grace and your grace for what you've done for us. Amen.